at best, only 3 in 10 Indians are vegetarian. And more realistically, the number stands at less than 2 in 10. Yet, India is often portrayed as the land of vegetarians in popular culture. Our guest today will probe this representation and reveal how vegetarianism varies across caste, religion, class, gender, states and time. There's a lot for us to unpack. This is your host Abhishek and today on Research Radio we'll speak to Balmurli Natarajan and Surat Jacob about the politics of vegetarianism in India. Dr. Jacob is a political economist affiliated with Azim Premji University in Bangalore and the Center for Development Studies Trivandrum. Dr. Natarajan is an anthropologist who is affiliated with the William Patterson University of New Jersey in the United States and Azim Premji University in Bangalore. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So, could you start by telling us about what made you both interested in researching about food and who decides who can eat what? Perhaps we can start with you, Murli. Let me begin by saying that I came to look at food practices uh, as increasingly become a very contentious marker of uh, caste and communal identities, especially. And uh, as an example of what I have called um, the culturalization of caste. Uh, so i am interested in how casteism camouflages itself as cultural difference or di- cultural differentiation and uh, this gets passed off um, then as simply a matter of taste in this case it for keeping company only with vegetarians and that, in that way caste and casteism gets camouflaged uh, so it's also opened up a way i think for us to think about um, stereotyping and most importantly this is this is what i've really learned working with suraj Uh, about uh, the variations within groups i've also been like murli uh, increasingly concerned about the turn towards you know strident cultural politics in our country and especially you know stereotyping of particular caste and religious groups and really a loss of of, of liberties and freedom in, in in the classical sense and this has been increasing in the last few years uh, and it seems to be very much entwined with issues of especially meat eating beef eating and and all kinds of moral policing so i into it uh, with those kinds of concerns uh, and to a great extent drawn in by murli who's been thinking about issues of caste as he mentioned for a long time right i think that that helps us uh, understand how both of y'all you know uh, arrived at this topic and uh, you've found that you know reported vegetarianism is most prevalent among brahmins when compared to other castes and also increases substantially with higher levels of income so these two kind of uh, differentiators what are some of the religious and cultural factors that are associated with vegetarianism religious factors uh, are really vastly exaggerated uh, when it comes to vegetarianism if we think of religious factors as uh, some form of rules uh, for example we found that only jains uh, whose practice and group norms are highly convergent uh, that is about 95% of the jains report to be vegetarian and uh, they may be said to be following jainism's religious injunctions which are fairly clear and strict around vegetarianism but there is no other religious injunction the, to be vegetarian in any other religion that that we know of at least in in the big religions in india and uh, yeah. there are of course religious injunctions against eating particular kinds of food like beef and pork but one needs to remember that uh, these are religious injunctions or uh, normative demands made of a membership of a religious community and they are not necessarily behavior determining there are uh, all kinds of individuals in in all the religions which have injunctions against eating some kinds of things who do end up eating things but with cultural factors if we think of culture as uh, uh, the meaningful context that shape any practice definitely cultural factors do impact to some extent and this is largely because uh, culture is about habit formation and these habits are uh, deeply ingrained from a very young age where one then uh, learns to relate to particular foods especially as um, uh, comforting foods because they are meaningful and they are very familiar uh, however even here uh, we should be very vigilant that culture is always contested and people Uh, do question as to who decides what is cultural tradition and no one is a cultural conformist all their lives some transgress cultural boundaries every day and i remember growing up 
normatively vegetarian household, but there were all kinds of uh, temptations and seductions of meat eating outside the home. And I did engage in it, but uh, never reported it back inside. And we only started eating eggs when my grandma decided, along with a bunch of other folks in uh, 1970s, uh, Mumbai. Uh, so culture does change, traditions change. And so we should expect to see all kinds of deviations or gaps between norms usually imposed by high status individuals in the family or community leaders and actual practice. So in some, what I would say is more than religious or cultural factors, it's really social pressures uh, that are by far the most significant shapers of vegetarianism. That is the pressures of group conformity and uh, families and uh, some some form of effective group uh, for that individual or community leaders. They are the ones who exert pressures to conform. And this is very political in the sense that uh, drawing group boundaries, uh, making and maintaining those group boundaries is done by exerting power. And that calls for uh, conformity from the individual, which may or may not happen in reality. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yes, and you definitely know that people are transgressing these boundaries. Um, along with caste, another differentiator that you spend time trying to unpack in the article is gender. You've written that, you know, the overall incidence of vegetarianism among women and men stood at 29% and 20% respectively. That means, uh, as you observe, that incidence among women is almost 50% higher than the incidence for men. What does this gap suggest about vegetarianism? And are there important variations and exceptions that, you know, we should understand? That uh, that gap is... uh holds fairly uh, constant across many different subgroups of the population, which uh, need not have been. So uh, in, in, in rural areas, the gap is about 10%. In urban areas, it's about 10 percentage points. Within urban areas, for large cities, it's about 10 percentage points. Small towns, the, the official scheduled caste category, again, about 10 percentage point difference. Within the official OBC category, for the middle class category, uh, as defined uh, in the NFHS and so on. So... Um, this this is it was really interesting. Uh, now we know uh, from general you know uh, understanding of how how gendering works, how patriarchy works, that um, there are uh, structures and practices around patriarchy which might um, create a, a gender gap where women report greater um, incidence of uh, vegetarianism. As Murli just mentioned, you know in in the, in the example he was giving of occasionally eating meat uh, outside the home kinds of incidents uh, traditionally perhaps are more possible with men than women, given the the nature of of, of, uh, family setups and the greater uh, uh, sets of proscriptions that women face in in many, many situations. So it could be that um, that men are able to eat uh, meat uh, outside the household uh, in vegetarian um, households more easily. Uh, And I think in in one of the uh, papers, we we use the term with greater moral impunity than so, in some sense, um, the, the the tradition um, uh, or, or the assumed tradition, the presumed uh, static tradition of vegetarianism, wherever that holds, seems to you know rest more on women, uh, while men can uh, more easily transgress. Um, the other very striking thing from the data is that um, in states where um, men uh, report greater incidence of vegetarianism, and we, by the way, we find a considerable variation across India's states large uh, variations uh, across regarding reported uh, vegetarianism. So in, in states where uh, men uh, report more uh, vegetarianism compared to other states, the gap, the gender gap is also more. Similarly, um, in states uh, where there are greater cultural political pressures towards vegetarianism today, those are the states with greater gender gaps. Uh, similarly, in richer economic classes, there's a greater gender gap. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether this, this is necessarily expected. Uh, uh, this does call for explanation to why, when, where in groups or regions where men report high uh, uh, rates of vegetarianism, it's precisely in those groups or, or, or uh, regions where the gap, women report that much more uh, incidence of vegetarianism. And we slightly speculate or we think that uh, much of the explanation, again, uh, uh, rests um, on what what I mentioned earlier, which is these are precisely the places where women are made the, the repository of, of holding the tradition. Uh, and, and that 
to that static presumed tradition. So these statistical facts seem to uh, to be consistent with, with that kind of explanation. Uh, meat eating is uh, also associated with masculinity many times, especially I would uh, hasten to add in those parts uh, of uh, or local regions where the dominant caste is not a normatively vegetarian caste. And there are several of these places. So there is some way in which masculinity also plays a role in the participating in meat eating, albeit outside of the home. Actually, uh, that that's quite interesting. If you'd like to expand on that through an example or two, I, I think I think I would I would just like to say the following. I mean, this is a huge huge issue. We need to also think of caste not in a Brahminical way. That is that there are. I mean, if you actually look at uh, Hindu gods, all of them, uh, most of them, I would say, are from normatively uh, meat eating families and castes. And uh, so meat, meat is something that the um, so-called second Varna, uh, and Varna is not the same as Jati, but uh, with the Kshatriya Varna, meat eating is, is a hallmark of it. So Rajputs, Thakurs, you name it, they are all meat eaters. And they not only eat meat, they have certain cultural ways of giving meaning to meat eating uh, that uh, converges in some way into masculinity. So we need to then be very clear that meat eating is not just tolerated. Meat eating has a very high place within the caste system. Some people are expected to eat meat. Those who are uh, kings, chieftains and royal lineages and uh, so-called high prestige lineages, um, meat eating is a very regular thing. And all of this, uh, we can also expand it even further to remember that meat eating itself has got a lot of ancient history to it, including beef eating. So we have more occasion to talk about that. Yes, we, we definitely will. Uh, that was quite insightful. Uh, so you found large variations in reported beef eating by Muslims and scheduled castes across different states, particularly based on their share in the overall population in those specific states. Could you walk us through these findings? So, so these are two particularly uh, important groups given the kinds of you know cultural and political pressures people in India face today, the Muslims and the scheduled castes, um, or the Dalits. So, um, and these are uh, two social groups where um, there are no prescriptions on beef eating. At least in the case of uh, Dalits, there is a revival of, of perhaps a creation of new traditions of valorizing beef eating. Um, so, uh, so, so it's. So given that, um, we, we were curious to know whether uh, Muslims and, and uh, Dalits, uh, in the data, you know, it's the scheduled caste, um, whether these two groups um, uh, report similar patterns of, of beef eating across different regions of the country, given that historically and in terms of their own cultural practices, there is no prescription. And what we found is that uh, it's precisely in those states where Muslims, uh, for example, have higher population shares that in the NFHS, um, uh, sorry, in the NSS survey, they do report beef eating. So that is to say, in parts of the country uh, where there are larger numbers of Muslims, there Muslims report uh, beef eating much more than in parts of the country where there is far less um, uh, a Muslim uh, population um, is part of the overall population. So, for example, um, uh, Muslims in Uttar Pradesh uh, report a greater incidence of beef eating, uh, more than double uh, that of Tamil Nadu, where the Muslim population as a, as a percentage of the total population is less. Um, so this is a very striking finding again. Uh, we think that like many of our findings, it, it suggests, it is suggestive, at least ind indirectly, of the play of, of cultural political pressure in the sense that where um, there is a strength in numbers, uh, perhaps um, you know these uh, uh, particular social groups can quote unquote afford to admit or or or, or uh, 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 beef eating. Uh, they do not have to misrepresent uh, beef eating, and it's where they uh, they are in much smaller numbers, uh, where they perhaps feel more vulnerable that they seem to be reporting less incidents of beef eating. So so that's um, so. It is a little speculative, but we see a, 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 a pattern here 
of how cultural political pressures seem to be shaping uh, many of these very robust uh, observed patterns. Um, so uh, similarly, uh, when it comes to uh, Dalits, uh, scheduled castes in the data, uh, it turns out that the states where uh, scheduled castes report beef eating the most are the states where there is a much, there is probably a longer uh, uh, and stronger history of Dalit liberation movements. The southern states, uh, Adhra Pradesh, Telangana, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Karnataka, but to a lesser extent, because Karnataka also has seen much greater presence of the cultural, political, Hindutva fueled pressures for vegetarianism compared to the other South Indian states. So again, we see that the pattern of beef eating among scheduled castes seem to, it seems to be consistent with this idea that where there is the ability to be more confident in expressing you know, one's freedoms, that's precisely where uh, people do admit uh, to beef eating in groups where there is uh, absolutely no proscription. In addition, uh, we find that there is a connection um, even politically with, with uh, trends of beef eating um, in different states and voting for, let us say, the big political formations today, the Congress, the BJP and so on. That too seems to be connected. So, so I think in the paper overall, we, we, we are trying to draw these connections to, to make a case that the prevailing set of pressures of conformity seem to be operating in ways which generate lots of variation uh, across states, across groups in what people claim to be eating. Yes, voting patterns is something I I definitely want us to discuss, Uh, especially since in the article you share that states with greater BJP vote share tend to have lower incidence of beef eating, both among Muslims and uh, scheduled castes. This lends support to your argument that cultural and political pressures do indeed affect dietary choices. Could you tell us more about some of the other factors that affect beef avoidance and vegetarianism, such as uh, perhaps the role of the Hindutva movement? Beef eating has been politicized now for at least a couple of centuries that we know. And by that we mean that it has become a clear marker or sign of group identity, in this case communal or religious group identity, and therefore it's very closely monitored. And this has made beef eating into a hazardous act. I'm not talking about health, but I'm talking about social health. One can get lynched in today's India for doing anything around beef. And so the strength in numbers that Suraj mentioned and we were talking about is uh, the mechanism that actually motivates that, animates that, is really the conversion of those numbers into some political strength. So um, given that, then we can say culturally speaking, vegetarianism, uh, as we show in our second paper, is not necessarily growing as seen in the last decade, uh, which is really the Hindutva decade. I mean, overall, it has not grown. And even here, we need to bear in mind the distinctions, again, as I've repeated endlessly about what one says and what one does and how data is collected. But what can be said is that there's a political culture now that valorizes vegetarianism in a way that has not happened for a very long time. And uh, the complication, of course, is that most Hindus, definitely including those Hindus who support the Hindutva regime, they do like to eat some meat. It could be chicken and goat. So the real issue really is beef. And here, the Dalit movements with beef festivals and things like that, acts of assertions, um, that uh, openly defied, but it's not only Dalit movements. It is it is also non-Dalit movements, movements that um, are uh, secular, movements that are in one way or another aghast at what is happening to individual rights. In fact, the uh, the first EPW paper we published was also written in the wake of a high court decision that that brought into view uh, something about the need to think about the right to eat what one wants to eat. And uh, so there are other kinds of social movements that are countering some of this imposition of imposition of prescriptions around, around beef. And uh, I would like to really point out that one of the early public interest litigations that was filed in Madurai was by uh, um, a woman. Uh, her name was uh, Selva Gomati, and she filed against the beef ban, uh, saying that it impinged on individual rights, and she uh, is a uh, self-declared vegetarian. So one needs to also take into account that it is not only Dalits and Muslims who are called upon to fight back on this. There are lots of allies. 
Right, right. And India is also painted as this land of vegetarians and uh, people who pray to cows. So could could we explore some of the globalizing pressures that are involved in this portrayal? As I said early on in this interview, uh, caste uh, hides behind uh, culture. Uh, culture comes to save caste uh, by um, pretending that what is happening is really a matter of tastes about food and not really discriminations about um, human beings based on stereotypes and uh, notions of group and birth group and things like that. So frequently people are asked several questions even in the workplace and uh, uh, there is a uh, recent case in California uh, which has now come to be known as the Cisco caste case and and in that uh, we are now finding that there are lots of small ways in which people are, are trying to find out what is the caste of someone else and uh, overwhelmingly, the main thing is whether someone is a Dalit or not. And that then gets coded in some ways about whether one eats meat, whether one eats beef and things like that. So uh, there is a need to kind of make sure that these kinds of constructions of what is India, which is an incredibly diverse uh, and dynamic territory, uh, how it gets represented in hegemonic uh, media. But there's a political economy also that I want to add to this. I mean, India is definitely one of the largest beef exporting countries in the world. And uh, there is a way in which uh, the politics of leather has to also be part of this. That uh, uh, how can we have diktats against beef eating, which end up into vigilantism that lynch people and uh, worse show a larger crowd that is baying for blood and actually mutely watching it and uh, sharing it on viral videos, while at the same time, we valorize both Hindustani and Carnatic classical music, where the tabla and the mridangam are entirely based on the leather industry and the labor of, of Dalits, who are actually typically excluded from these spaces at all in, in terms of being given access to opportunities to even learn, let alone actually come on stage and do anything like that. And it has also then got something to do with the fact that we are a cricket crazy nation where we look at men uh, hitting and chasing leather balls. I, I, I mean, there are all kinds of hypocritical issues that actually come out in this kind of a construction of India as a vegetarian and a beef eschewing country when many times one of the first foods that any immigrant who comes here at some point or another uh, either through temptation or through desires or whatever else, breaking free from certain restrictions at home, comes and eats a Big Mac burger. They may not continue to eat it after a while once they find out what is in it. But nonetheless, I mean, there are all kinds of transgressions. Definitely with the second generation immigrants here, the kids um, have their own ways of growing up with uh, food cultures that are quite different from their parents. Uh, so there's an immense amount of toleration uh, within these families uh, that that do have second and third generation kids growing up here, um, toleration of different varieties of food habits, and that somehow does not get translated into creation of images and ideas and representations of India. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And this is also something that I remember that you've covered in the article that, you know, quote, geography and underlying agroecology, as well as the cultural norms influenced by it, plays a much bigger role than social group identities and associated cultural norms, end quote. What does this finding suggest about the structure of the caste system and process of uh, Brahmanization? Caste is not simply about status or prestige. It's uh, always intimately been connected to both labor and ecology. And uh, indeed, uh, caste develops as a set of practices, uh, both institutionalized and informal, uh, largely in the plains agrarian economy. So caste and labor are um, intertwined as are caste and class. Uh, it is important, therefore, to remember that caste is not just a simple natural division of labor. Labor's value itself is socially determined. And in the Indian situation, caste is a major factor that determines that, uh, including control over labor process and allocation of resources and things like that. And with this control comes domination and humiliation. That's where Brahminism proper comes into play. Uh, but it's all along also a caste class process. 
and all this happens within an ecology of uh, livelihood let's say and uh, generation of sustenance uh, along with extraction of surplus from some groups to other groups and india's several agro eco zones in that sense uh, may be each set to have their own mini caste systems and in fact caste is definitely a local regional phenomenon although it many times appears to have an all india uh, status right so we need to keep thinking about it in both ways yeah and mostly there are some well known examples such as the brahmins of kashmir or bengal give given their uh, you know agro ecological histories they have traditionally not been vegetarian so when when a group a caste group moves from one place to another there is an adaptation to local foods and that local foods are are a combination of what is ecologically and economically available so it's also about the working class or middle class or upper class character of of the family or group that moves but it's also about then a way in which cultural adaptations take place so there's lots of uh, histories of migrations of let's say uh, tamils from tamil nadu to um, west bengal or tamil nadu to bombay and both west bengal and, and parts of west bengal and parts of maharashtra where tamils go and settle have very different food cultures and o- over at least one generation the group typically ends up adapting to some extent and that adaptation varies according to caste and class one can say but also according to how individual families tend to be varying in terms of how norms are imposed or not so those could be examples of uh, then how agro ecology actually in some way shapes diet or geography shapes diet in some way more than uh, you know a very simplistic application of this is what my caste has prescribed and this is what i'll do uh, it is more clearly seen by those caste who migrate out of the country where then the waters from the dam just rush out people just completely eat something that is been earlier on proscribed right right and 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 your most recent analysis on the subject of our discussion today suggests that privileged castes have become more assertive about vegetarianism based on a comparison of 2005 2006 data and 2015 2016 data can you tell us more about this shift maybe at one level uh, there might have been an expectation of greater vegetarianism over time uh, but very interestingly we find that uh, the overall incidence of vegetarianism uh, uh separated uh, the two ends of this decade is is pretty similar so there has been little overall change for both women and men however what's interesting is that this overall lack of change over time hides interesting subgroup changes and specifically we find that uh, the nfhs has uh, in terms of economic class has, uh, divides people into five wealth quintiles they call them from poorest to richest and we find that if you if you tra- uh, trace the incidence of vegetarianism of of the five different economic classes over this decade we find that it's only in the richest quintile the richest category that uh, um, that there is a change and that's a change towards increasing vegetarianism by a few percentage points uh, the others don't have much of a change slight decrease and therefore the overall picture uh, is is that there is not much change but that hides the fact that among the the most privileged of the five economic classes in the data set there is an increasing trend towards vegetarianism uh, similarly if one looks at some of these um, uh, the, 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 these big social groups the mega caste categories schedule caste schedule tribes obcs and uh, all the rest uh, which is the slightly more privileged traditionally more privileged caste groups again we find that while overall there is not much change over the decade for the privileged caste the non sc st obc there is actually an increase um, uh, uh, in the incidence of vegetarianism so this uh, partly is why um, you know we gave uh, the the title deepening divides to that second paper that that you referenced what appears on surface to be a lack of change is hiding the fact that economically and socially more privileged groups are uh, reporting greater uh, vegetarianism that might be linked um, in many ways to the the broader pressures uh, towards conformity to a particular stereotype and a, and a construction of a national identity that, that we've been discussing in 
Interestingly, um, regional variation also shows divergence over this decade. That is to say, states which at the start of the decade, uh, that is to say in 2005, the states where there was already a pretty high uh, incidence of vegetarianism, those are the states where it increased a lot more. While states uh, which started uh, in 2005 with re relatively less incidence of vegetarianism uh, did not um, uh, increase um, you know, their incidence. In some cases, like in Karnataka, uh, vegetarianism went down. So what we find, therefore, is even in terms of uh, spatial or geographical uh, variations, there has been a deepening divide. States, which, um, uh, and that again coincides somewhat to, to a large extent with with uh, you know, where these these, uh, for example, the north and the west of the country, where these the, the new you know political pressures towards conformity are stronger than others. So there is a deepening divide. Um, and it's very much connected with, with uh, the North and the West, from Gujarat to Rajasthan to Haryana, Punjab to Machal, uh, and to a smaller degree, UP and NP. So uh, while um, the, the South and the East of the country, and of course the Northeast um, is, is totally different in, in these matters, but the South, East, Northeast um, uh, do not seem to be, you know, um, in this sort of conformity story. So, so again, we see there are um, divides um, and we do interpret it. I mean, you you you, you quoted. You know, we, we do use the word assertive. That the, you know, privileged groups are being assertive. We uh, so that is an interpretation uh, from the statistical patterns that, um, that we are inferring. Um, that uh, why is it that particularly the privileged economic and social groups are the ones which are turning to vegetarianism more over time than others. So we do think that that is a that is connected with the hegemonic pressures. Uh -huh. And switching gears a bit to the life this article has had outside the pages of EPW, uh, are there any interesting ways in which people have engaged uh, with this work and its findings? Um, there was at least one interesting place where uh, the engagement happened and it was a translation in Tamil of our entire first EPW piece, uh, everything. And this happened to be done by an activist group in Tamil Nadu. Uh, so we're very happy about that. Uh, I mean, Tamil Nadu happens to be, Suresh, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the places with the lowest incidence of vegetarianism. So so there's a lot with, in terms of groups who want to bust some of these myths. And uh, But many other local newspapers also published excerpts and they paraphrased it. I know that The Wire, for example, did a long online one also in Hindi as well as did something else in English. The BBC covered it. I know some people are using it. Uh, as readings in their teachings. And increasingly, many other studies are also coming out regularly and some of them have cited us. So, so we feel that it still is making the rounds. In one of the um, colleges that my uh, organization was, uh, runs, uh, we, we set up, a, we built a new canteen, uh, uh, a cafe about a year back, a year and a half back ago. And um, the issue came about, you know, deciding the menu and, you know, all the nitty gritties of, to contract it out to and to make this a student space and so on. And um, so the small committee was set up and uh, uh, that particular area uh, uh, is uh, most of the faculty, even though actually uh, uh, Southern Rajasthan, it falls within uh, Adivasi you know, uh, region, almost all the faculty are drawn from Brahmin um, uh, and related castes. So, so somebody suggested egg sandwich uh, as one of the items on the menu. and. Um, uh, very predictably and uh, automatically, you know, one of the faculty said, no, of course, that's, you know, I mean, clearly we can't take that seriously. And uh, that was it. And uh, everybody, of course, nodded uh, and, and moved on. Uh, I sort of said, hey, wait a minute. Uh, uh, and then I played the, you know, the, the outsider. Uh, I was not from there. And so, yeah, uh, why, uh, why should we not entertain this? And then um, that, particular faculty member, she just said, matter of fact, yeah, because we won't come to the cafe if, if it happens to serve um, egg sandwiches. We're not talking about <laughs> chicken or beef here. I, of course, I knew that these are very sensitive matters and one can easily, you know, turn the dialogue in, in you know, in unproductive ways and then one loses, one loses the story. So I managed, I think, or we managed to have a little bit of dialogue and follow up on that. And actually, I used that opportunity to share this paper uh, because it, it came naturally. And uh, I don't know if people read it, but at least, you know, 
bit of a discussion. I have a feeling they still sort of wrote it off as yeah, oddball outsider kind of view. A little bit of regret that I, I didn't do more on that. And um, similar stories. I mean, you know, uh, they're small, but I, I now in retrospect read them as uh, you know. I think ultimately there has to be trust. You know, I mean, um, I was a good team player. I happened to be head the organization then, so we had to, in some sense, listen to what what I uh, was saying at that time. But I think um, uh, if, if 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 those relations within organizations can be created, as we were creating, it, I think uh, um, we 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 could talk about these things in a society where even talking about that was was uh, was not done was dangerous. And I think we need more of that kind of. So I think you know, if if one just threw throws this EPW paper at them. I can imagine, um, you know, from where they come from, um, the response uh, would not help in any way. One has to build those relations of trust or, or at least of, of dialogue. This one can, I mean, that's just the reality of, as I see it in many of these spaces as to how, how things have come to be. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I think there at least we got some dialogue going. Um, though I don't know, I mean, <laughs> The, the final menu of the uh, of the can- cafe did not have <laughs> egg sandwich, and I did not insist. Uh, uh, I had other fish to fry there, so to speak. So, I, uh, you know, other complicated issues. But I mean, now you mention it in retrospect, I think those are the spaces, and this, these are the ways, and the, perhaps the only ways we can reach them. And in that sense, writing a paper with good methodology and you know and so on, I don't think uh, is sufficient. Because it has to uh, enter, you know, uh, yeah, their their practice in ways in which which can make them rethink. Because it's all too easy for it to enter in a way that actually further polarizes. Yes, yes, and uh, this last question that I have is a little more future looking, and it's about some of the unanswered questions that you continue to investigate. To me, I think there are uh, at least two things that we still feel are puzzles. One of them is why are some groups more conformist than others, or how is how is conformity realized, and what really are the social mechanisms of control that are exercised in order to produce the effect of conformity? So we are quite uh, still mulling over the puzzle of um, uh, Punjab and how highly vegetarian it is, as opposed to the myth of chicken tikka and all that. And uh, of course, the other end is and we talk about this in the paper, is about how uh, the idli or dosa has come to stand in for um, Tamil or Kerala food, whereas both those states are have very low vegetarianism. And uh, so that's one part. Another thing I would say is, which we stayed away from, In I mean, although we may have mentioned it here and there, I think the battles, the cultural and political battles over food are central. But there are also ecological and ethical aspects of food and food habits and that includes health. So how does one put this kind of a mix uh, into play? So food is definitely a part of the cultural politics which goes through caste and uh, casteism and communalism. But there's also ecology, ethics and health. Uh, I don't think we've done any move towards doing anything about it in that paper. So that, that would be questions to investigate. And one broader sort of methodological or, or epistemological sort of um, bent that brought us together, uh, you know, uh, Vishek, uh, was uh, investigation, investigating contexts, going with the sense that there is variation all around. And yet, you know, there are so many, not just politically informed, but so many, you know, tendencies to generalize, to stereotype and so on, as we've discussed in the course of this conversation. So I think um, uh, in the different, we've done two, three different projects, uh, uh, Muli and I, including the one we are currently doing on, on targets and some other follow-up research in Chhattisgarh. All of that, I think, is trying to foreground what does it mean to say, you know, a person's practices or a group's practices uh, are, are contextual. And what is context? Um, uh, how 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 does how is it shaped and what are the processes uh, even as uh, the, the norm of vegetarianism to the extent some hold that there is one uh, is is not timeless um, made and unmade and remade so uh, so what are the processes through which these things happen uh, which create and recreate context I think um, that's uh, that's an abiding uh, concern uh, methodologically uh, how does one even begin to 
to to approach this uh, so we've we've uh, found ways for example by looking at food and variations and and, and stereotypes and pressures around it uh, toilet practices and, and other things um, so that uh, goes beyond the, the, the these food papers uh, but i think that's that's a that's an interest that we are i think uh, pursuing in different ways Murli and Suraj thank you so much for providing us with rich insights and definitely a lot of context to dietary patterns and how they matter. Uh, thank you Abhishek and uh, all the best to you and to PPW. Yeah thank you Abhishek I think um, we are very glad that you know this kind of initiative is happening and you know the blues finding newer ways to connect and take this conversation along. I'm very glad to to know that this is happening. One thing that stood out to me from our conversation was that a decade after 2005, reported vegetarianism had not increased overall. However, economically and socially more privileged groups reported greater vegetarianism. The fault lines are deepening. For more on that and other facets and data on vegetarianism, I highly recommend checking out the two articles Murli and Suraj have published in EPW and I've shared links to both in the show notes. Next week we'll speak to Jean Drez, Prankur Gupta, Ritika Khera and Isabella Pimenta about India's public distribution system. They'll be sharing details based on ground level research across six of India's poorest states and they'll also offer recommendations on how the PDS system can be reformed. I'm eagerly looking forward to that conversation and if it sounds exciting to you too, do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and we'd love to get your feedback via any of EPW's social media accounts. Take care and I'll see you next week.